Tundran Media presents The Mayor Helps with the Mayor of Victoria, British Columbia, Bolisa Helps. Have your say. Send your questions and comments to themayorhelps.com. They could be included and, in next uh, week's Victoria show. businesses to know that we're working. And now, here's your host from beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, Dave Hatt. Well, welcome to The Mayor Helps with Lisa Helps. I'm Dave Hatt. And later in this show, we'll be chatting with Melanie Rupp of the Women's Enterprise Center to get her take on how COVID has affected women in business. Uh, first, though, we've got our state of the city with Mayor Lisa. Mayor, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yeah, middle of the week. It's sunny out there. Uh, you know, th things are th things are busy downtown. Uh, you know, I was actually out for a beer on uh, Monday after work on Government Street, sitting on the street for the first time, and there was a real buzz. So there's, uh, you know, for for the businesses that are doing, uh, you know, got those patios open, it it seems to be going well and, and downtown feels alive. Not the same kind of alive as with millions of tourists pouring in, but I think locals are poking their heads up and saying, huh, what does my city look like this summer? Yeah, it, it's been it's been pretty cool. And I, it's interesting because being on the island, I think we've got a little bit of a, um, a grace period, I guess, or, you know, it, it's being isolated by the Pacific Ocean, uh, you know, it's it's protected us from a lot of the the massive COVID. And I, I look at my friends to the south, and I just oh, hope I hope against hope that something gets figured out to save them because the powers that be aren't gonna. Anyway, without getting too deep into that side of things, I would like to talk to you today about the issue of amalgamation. So we live in an area, commonly what's well, the city of Victoria, but commonly referred to as the Capital Regional District, the CRD. And there's a give or take 350, 380,000 people that live here. Uh, 13 municipalities, 13 mayors. And I know that this uh, recently, not this past week, but recently um, there was something that happened around the amalgamation where we've got the city of Saanich just north of the city. Um, and I know that you and your council and the council of Saanich are working together to um, Pro uh, provide uh, the ability for a study to be done to see what how it would work to amalgamate. Wanted to get your take on amalgamation. This is something that's been happening this debate for years, as far as I long as I've known in this city. What are your What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, the debate's actually been happening since the 1930s, if you can believe it. It's one of those ones that goes back decades. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to the citizens assembly that's going to be created between Saanich uh, and Victoria to explore this question. I think a citizens assembly is the way to go uh, because we're going to draw together. I think we landed on 75 citizens who will be led through a process by an independent outside facilitator with some experience in citizens assemblies and they will make their recommendation based on a whole number of factors. So. I don't want to presuppose what they might say. Um, I think there are definitely merits to uh, to looking at it, obviously. Um, I, I don't know that the amalgamation of all 13 municipalities makes any sense um, just because of the very, very different land use patterns. Like, you know, sitting here in downtown Victoria, I wouldn't want to make a decision about a rezoning application in, in Souk or in the Chosen. Uh, so, because I think that those communities know their communities best, but, but I also think that if anyone came to the region today and started uh, a government, they wouldn't start 13. So, um, you know, I, I think that it, it definitely, the, the, the conversation between Victoria and Saanich will be interesting to see whether that goes anywhere or not. Um, but also, I think, um, you know, I've been in, in this gig long enough and certainly been around long enough to know that if we wait for amalgamation to come together, if we wait for amalgamation to make things happen, we're going to be waiting forever. And so one of the ways that we've worked through this a little bit, and I, I like to think of it as, a, as economic amalgamation, is through the creation of the South Island Prosperity Partnership. So while we all have our own local governments and land use decisions and staff and all those things, in terms of uh, the economics and the economy of the region, we've, we've united, 11 out of 13 municipalities have united to create the South Island Prosperity Partnership, which is municipalities, First Nations, and large number of private sector members. And so I think one of the benefits of amalgamation is speaking one with one voice to the world uh, and, and the rest of the country. And I think with the Prosperity Partnership, we are starting to do that. So one last question then, and then we'll, we'll move on to our next segment. Um, financially, maybe you could, um 
give us a little insight into how it works? You hear about federal transfer payments. Does, does that have anything to do with, with the city, provincial or federal transfer payments? If we, were, if we drew from a larger pool of population, would we as a region uh, be entitled to more transfer money from the province and from, the, from the Canada? Um, not, not, the, not the way the current um, federal, provincial, municipal relationship is, is set up. Again, when we, when we speak with one voice, uh, when we apply with one voice, so another example is the Capital Regional District uh, Sewer Project. We've received uh, around $450 million from pro the province and Canada as a region to build a sewage project, and, and then we're collectively putting in the rest. So um, I think when we come together as, as one with one focus, uh, transit is another good one. I think everybody in the region through the Victoria Regional Transit Commission agrees on the importance of transit. And the Transit Commission is, a, in a sense, our amalgamated uh, approach to, to transit. And we're speaking with one voice to the province and to Ottawa. And I think that's, that's successful. So, um, you know, there, there may be some merits in being one rather than 13, but I, I know for certain that that's not going to happen anytime soon. And I've got a lot of respect for my colleagues across the region. Uh, during COVID, we've come to know each other quite well. We've got a was weekly now bi-weekly Zoom call where we all get together and share what's happening in each other's municipalities and how we can help and learn and support. So, um, yeah, I think people think that amalgamation would be a quick fix to a lot of things. I, I think, you know, that's, that's a, a stretch, uh, not going to happen probably in our lifetimes. Uh, so I always ask, what can we do uh, better, even though we're, we're separate, how can we come together? And I think we've seen some successes uh, in that. Thank you very much for your response. I appreciate your time and we'll see you on the other side. See you there. Have your say. Send your questions and comments to themayorhelps.com. They could be included in next week's show. All right, now it's time for uh, Ask the Mayor, and this is our portion of the Mayor Helps uh, show podcast where we have people from the community join us and ask Mayor Helps questions. And today we have Sharon Marshall, and she is the founder and CEO of Diva Training and Staffing Solutions. They're a full service staffing agency. Uh, providing temporary recruitment as well as digital literacy and virtual administrative training services for Indigenous women. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you for having me, Dave. Uh, feel free to just launch in and ask your question to Mayor Helps. Thank you. Um, and um, Your Worship, I'm just uh, curious, uh, what is local government doing uh, to help uh, the Indigenous entrepreneur? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great question. So just give me one second here. I want, to, I want to show you something. So we have created this plan. It's called Victoria 3.0. And it's our economic action plan uh, for the next 20 years to, to create a, a, diversive, a diverse and inclusive economy. And uh, in it, section three, I'll just show it to you, but um, I'd encourage you to go and download it. We have a whole section on supporting Indigenous businesses. Uh, in here. So uh, everything from working with the um, South Island Prosperity Partnership, and if you haven't linked up with them, uh, it would be great if you did. They hold um, prosperity gatherings and for Indigenous prosperity gatherings. So they bring together everyone uh, that's working uh, in Indigenous business on Indigenous businesses. They did one and they were going to do it annually, but a lot of the uh, people who attended and it was all Indigenous said, no, no, we want to do this quarterly. So that's that's really great. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go through the plan, but there's, there's a lot in here um, because we've been working very closely, particularly with the song He's in Esquimalt Nations, because that's whose homelands the city's on, through a, a, a very deep and intimate process of reconciliation over the last three years. And we, we've learned and we know that economic reconciliation is, is part of that. So um, it's a priority for us and it, there's a lot in here, but um, if there's, there's more you want to know, I'm happy to to share more, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about Diva and your business and what you do. Um, I, um, I created a 20 week online uh, training program to teach um, Indigenous women digital literacy and virtual administrative skills so that they can uh, become entrepreneurs and um, start their own businesses and or uh, go work in an office. And, and um, mainly I did that uh, to address the uh, uh, issue with the um, un high unemployment in remote communities. Okay, so your, your, your um, business is across British Columbia? Yes, okay. across Canada actually. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. That's yeah. great. And are you located in Victoria? 
Uh, I actually almost moved there. I, I just landed in Lanceville, but um, I, I do work in Victoria, and my daughter, my children will both end up being there. My daughter's there right now. Okay. University, so. That's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, so- thanks, Sharon. I appreciate the question. It was a very, a very timely and appropriate as we're speaking with a representative from the Women's Enterprise Center later on this morning. Thank you and very Sharon, much. We'll, we'll be in wait, touch. Wait, before, before you hang up, uh, if you want more information or have any questions, you could what, just email me. I'm very easy to find, uh, mayor at victoria.ca, and we'll make sure that we stay connected. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. for your time. And Thanks for your great work. Yeah, thank, thank you, me. Sharon. Take care. Bye-bye. Have your say. Send your questions and comments to themayorhelps.com. They could be included in next week's show. And now, Mayor Lisa Help sits down with this week's special guest. Welcome back to the Mayor Helps. Uh, today, we have Melanie Rupp. She's Director, Loans and Advisory Service for the Women's Enterprise Center. Uh, Melanie's done, spent most of her professional career dealing with helping women in business. And Melanie, welcome to the show and welcome and uh, introduce yourself to Mayor Helps. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I am with Women's Enterprise Center, and we're a not-for-profit uh, funded by the federal government serving women in the province of British Columbia. So we help women start a business, grow a business, or buy a business, and provide support from loans to business advice to skills development and mentoring. So it's that holistic support where often women get into business with no background at all in business. And so we're here to help them be successful in their business. It's, it's very interesting that you say that they get in with no, no background. I mean, that certainly was our path. My, my wife and I are own small business owners and you know, we yep. didn't really know much about it. So we just kind of jumped in. But th- through COVID, what are you hearing from women entrepreneurs? What are, what are, they, are they facing any challenges that, that are different, distinct, or, or is just kind of the same thing? What are you hearing? Wow, Dave, if you asked me that question, I think I could just go on and talk uh, for the full time we have about how it's impacted women-owned businesses. Um, What are the highlights? I think there's a couple of things that we're seeing. So, yes, women-owned businesses are severely impacted like everybody else. Uh, They are trying to navigate the government supports that are available. And uh, what we've seen is those government supports tended to go for the big businesses with wage subsidies and loan programs with very large loans. And women-owned businesses uh, tend to be smaller. Uh, Women haven't had their own businesses for as long as men have. And so they're starting with small businesses and they're growing those businesses. But over the years, we've seen a significant increase in women-owned businesses. So what we found was the government supports that were available they often didn't qualify. So you would look at the the Canada Emergency Business Account didn't qualify because they weren't incorporated. They were a sole proprietorship. And so they had to wait for the third revision to come through before they could finally access it. And even today, still some can't access it. And so they can look at uh, the regional relief and recovery fund. Um, So getting funding for the business, when they have funding to cover those non-deferrable fixed expenses, they can relax about where the money is going to come from and they can focus on getting the business back up and running. However, many of them are responsible for care at home. So if kids aren't in school, they've got to do homeschooling and they've got to look after what's going on on the home front. And it's really been a struggle for women to be able to get their businesses uh, carrying on and, and having them survive. So really challenging for women. I will also say one other thing. We all know that rent assistance is a big problem for businesses where landlords are not applying for the Canada Emergency um, Commercial Rent Assistance Program. The landlords have to apply for that program rather than the tenants. And I must say the stories that I'm hearing about intimidation and bullying from landlords to women-owned businesses is really distressing to me. Mm. Across, is that is that kind of uh, you know isolated, or is that is that something that you would say is a trend that that bullying of of women-owned businesses by landlords with regard to SECRA? 
Yeah, of course, that's a general statement. And I hear, I hear many, many stories of landlords who are bending over backwards to help their tenants, including women owned businesses. I talked to one client last week, and she has two locations. And she said, one landlord has been great, you know, he has applied for the the SECRA. And, and so she's able to get that rent relief there. But the other one, where her um, monthly rent is twenty thousand dollars a month for her business, he is not applying. Wow. And to to her credit, she's just a strong woman, and she says, "Here's your twenty five percent. If you want the rest, apply to Secra." <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's it's awesome. Really, that's great. Good for her. Good for her. Um, what do you think? Uh, you know, Dave asked about the the middle of the pandemic and how how businesses, women-owned businesses are managing. What does coming out the other side look like, you know, for your clients, the people that you're supporting and mentoring? Uh, is, is there a larger percentage of them that are going to fail compared to non-women-owned businesses? Are they more resilient? Um, do you have a sense of that yet or is it too early? Uh, no, we, I have a sense of it. I, I, you know, I deal with women entrepreneurs, so my, that's where my experience is. And so what I say about women entrepreneurs, I'm sure men experience much of the same things in other ways, but speaking specifically to women entrepreneurs, what is coming out the other side look like? Um, they're scared. You know, they're taking on all this debt if they have larger businesses and they're, um, sorry, they're, um, they don't know where the revenues are coming from. So that, that equation doesn't work where the revenues are down significantly, but the fixed expenses are still high. So they don't they're taking on the loans they've got money for now but they don't know where they're going to come out um, many businesses are not getting started or recovering as quickly as other ones and those ones are really worried so we've already seen where the government has said that they're going to extend the canada emergency wage subsidy to the end of december which is great but some of the other programs like the rental assistance program it just goes until july maybe august someone said so you know there's a time limit on that and what are they going to do in september because many of the businesses are not able to come back as quickly so i guess we'll just have to wait and see what the government does to support and i'm on a, a now a three times a week call with the federal government which has been fantastic in educating us but also in giving us an opportunity to provide that feedback to the government as i know many uh, chambers are and councils are and giving that information back to the government saying what is needed in order to keep small businesses afloat so what, what are you seeing or are there any examples that you're seeing where municipalities are dealing with the local small business community to assist? Are there best practices you're seeing out there in the world? Yeah, I've seen many uh, communities, uh, often it's a chamber and the Board of Trade or their Economic Development Commission really working together to support their small businesses. So there's a regular newsletter, there's a website that has resources on it. Um, there's a small business BC has a marketplace where small businesses can get on to let people know that they're open for business. Um, lot, lots of best pra practices that are out there. And the main thing is that the small businesses are um, sticking together and helping each other together. They're going to get through that. And with the government and the chamber support and the other resources that are out there together, they'll get through it. And the goal is to keep these businesses uh, floating until they can get through whatever it takes. And we're very much doing that at Women's Enterprise Center with our loan clients, working with them on their loan payments to um, now give them interest only payments so that they, they, they do have that interest only payment so they have to get some revenue in the business which I think is a good incentive to get their business up and going again but, but we will you know, work with them and whatever their cash flow can support to continue the payments uh, so that they don't have to worry about that um, loan payments but they can focus on getting the business up and running. But for many of them, they can only get up and running as quickly as the customers are coming back. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, 
the painful reality of all small business owners. We have uh, friends of ours that own a, a tailor uh, in town and, you know, one of the partners told me just this week, they're, they're ready just to pack their luggage and turn the keys over. Cause it's, that's some days and other days it's, there's a, you know, the sun is shining and things are a little brighter, but it's, it's very, very tough straight across the board. Um, one of the things I did want to ask you about is, is prior to COVID, what were some of the priorities you were seeing and that were in challenges that were facing women in business and have those uh, had to be backburnered or changed or, um, what were, what were some of the things you were dealing with before? Well, I, I think if we think back pre-COVID, how strong the economy was and how, you know, we had a label shortage. So the biggest problem businesses were facing is where do I find employees for my business? That wasn't unique to women-owned businesses. But also at that time, there, there was tremendous focus by the federal government, and there still is on women entrepreneurs, but to support them to grow businesses and to provide funding. And there was a lot of funding that came in, and we saw those businesses uh, growing and thriving, and it was a really strong ecosystem and environment for women-owned businesses. And we know that there haven't been as many women-owned businesses. We're trying to increase the percentages, and that was going very, very strong. And so, yeah, the challenges that they had, well, finding access to capital is always a challenge, and that's why Women's Enterprise Center provides such a needed um, service in the, in the province because we provide that loan funding up to $150,000. Um, so getting access to capital is, was very difficult for women, and so there's a lot being done there. I mean, the money is still there, but it's uh, harder, harder to get. So I got a, a question. So what do you see that women do exceedingly well when they start their business, when they, when they launch? What are some of the things that we as men can learn? From, from <laughs> That's them? a great question, Dave. I love it. Very humble. There's lots, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I've been working for women, with women entrepreneurs for 15 years. And um, I see women bring different ideas and ways of doing business to the world. And the world needs more of that to bring it back in balance. So what do women, women are really focused on making a difference. They have a passion, they see a need in the community, and they're doing things because they want to change things. They want to bring something different. They also want to do things differently. So, you know, balancing their, their, their business and their family and adjusting their schedules and having the flexibility is not often not available to them in the corporate world. And we, we see women women leaving the corporate world and people think they're going to retire, but no, they're not. They're going to do things because they want to do it their way. And I think that's uh, the way women do business is something to be celebrated. We need more of it. Uh, and, and that's where we need to provide the government support and the programs like Women's Enterprise Center to help those women start businesses and grow because we need them to do things differently. So do you have, are there any specific examples you might have? I don't know if I, I asked you this question already in quite these words, but any specific examples you have that maybe the mayor and I could, could take away where a municipality is working directly with businesses, short, short of facilitating, as you say, the, the Chamber of Commerce and those kind of things. Um, is there anything you've seen, it you know, could be in Europe, could be in, in Latin America, anything you're seeing where they're helping support uh, women business? how um, municipalities are supporting yeah yeah businesses. specifically yes yes um hmm, i'm trying you might to not have think. an answer to it yeah no i think um there there you know there i would say what i see happening is municipalities supporting their uh, economic development associations and um their uh their chambers and because those are the organizations that are, have direct contact with women-owned businesses and providing that support. And I think at a municipal level is, is having an awareness of the value that women-owned businesses bring to a community and thinking about what are we doing to support women-owned businesses. And secondly, are there any unconscious bias that we have about the decisions that we make that may inadvertently negatively impact women-owned businesses. 
And and what can we do to support women-owned businesses? And I know municipalities that have a strong focus on childcare in their communities because women need the childcare in order to have the time and space to create those wildly successful businesses. Mm. Well, that's a really good insight. Yeah, we um, it, you'll you'll love this, Melanie, at the city of Victoria. Uh, so our city manager is, is a woman, obviously awesome. I'm a woman, um, awesome. but the, the head of business and community relations, Carrie Moore is a woman and our business ambassador, Quinn Anglin is a woman. So I think there, it's, it's really interesting. It just occurs to me now, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before, uh, you know, we're sitting here with you, but uh, particularly the two people in the city who are directly interfacing with uh, business are, are, are women, that, that they're in charge of the city's relationship with business. So. I think that they, and, and Quinn herself, our business ambassador, used to run a small business. We plucked her uh, out of her business and, and brought her into City Hall so she could she could help uh, businesses uh, navigate city processes. So that's, that's really good insight that you've provided, that that kind of gendered lens matters. It matters so much, Lisa, and I'm just, it just makes my heart sing to hear all these women in leadership positions. Because when a woman deals with another woman, they feel that you are seeing them as a woman. And I guess what I would caution is that you, you see them as women business owners and you're not acting with male characteristics, which can happen so often when you are mentored and um, groomed by men, if I can use those words, that you, you, you see what they bring as women so for example, we had um, a client that we were dealing with that was referred to us and we were doing a program where it was a sort of a training program run by a number of organizations around the province and we offered it a women-focused advisor. And this woman business owner was referred to us because the male advisor who was working with her said, oh, she she's she's all over the place and she's very scattered and you know i think she just needs some guidance from you so i think you'd be better to work with her and our advisor was working with her and she had young children and she was managing their schedules and she was working around their sleep schedules and you know getting the play dates organized and she was very focused on her business but it didn't seem that way on the outside because she was multitasking all these other things as women have to do but you were very clear with her on what she needed to do in the program, what the next steps were, and you let her a week and she went away and did it in her own time and she came back and was ready to move on to the next step. And I think as a woman focused advisor, we understand that these are the stresses that women deal with and it's totally fine. It doesn't set us off at all. And I think that's the same thing that I would encourage with other women leading and talking to supporting women is, you know, they just, they do it in their own way that they have to do. Yeah. Um, I, I have one one other question. I don't know uh, how much more time we have, but um, and it's going back to COVID and, and, and post COVID. And this, this isn't, this isn't a happy question and there probably isn't a happy answer, but I think it's a really important to, question to turn our minds to. Certainly I'm doing that as mayor and I wonder if you are at the Women's Enterprise Center as well. Uh, how do we support the businesses that are going to fail? How do we support people to fail well, um, to recognize that it's not their failure, but that we're in the worst economic crisis since the depression and, and then, you know, to support them, you know, businesses, I, I like to think of it that businesses will fail, but entrepreneurs will not. And so, exactly. so ha, what are your, have you turned your mind to that as what well, already or? Yeah, I, I really, I don't look at that. I'm a sunny person. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It's a good question. And you're absolutely right. It's the business that failed and not the entrepreneur. And realizing that some businesses are in industries where the, 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 the demand is just no longer there and the business is no longer sustainable. And I think the hardest decision for an entrepreneur to make is to shut down their business like that shutting down your business well and ending well when that is the best alternative under the circumstances 
is a very courageous and brave thing to do. And there is no shame in doing that. And that they will rise again. Um, that, that just understanding that there are some businesses that are not going to make it through because the demand isn't there and it's just no longer viable. And it, you failed because of COVID and that is the way it is. And so how do you get out of it the best way possible? And with uh, our loan clients, you know, we've had many of them fail over the years, but we have worked with them to continue to repay their loan to protect their credit rating so that they can go on to continue on in another business should that be what they want to do. Um, so it, I guess there is no shame in failure and just finish well if that's what it needs to be and there's always another chance. You learn so much from failure and there are many many examples of businesses that have failed and the entrepreneur comes back and does a, another business and often it's very successful. That's, yeah. the, that's the key, I think, is no, no matter whether uh, we're, we're men or women or black or white, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, your you're, odds are good you're going to find a way to, to make it through. Thank exactly. you, Melanie. I, I appreciate your time. It's, it's been really informative. and, and uh, Thank good you so much for show. having me. Yeah. And thanks appreciate for your it. great work. Thank you, Lisa. And yours too. Keep up the great work. I'm excited about your uh, team that you have there. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. It was a pleasure. Thanks. You made it thank easy. You. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for joining The Mayor Helps on Tundra and Media. If you enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And visit themayorhelps.com to submit your questions to the show. 